<laughs> Hello, welcome everybody. I'm Michael Rugel from the National Museum of American Jewish Military History. We tell the story of Jews in the American military uh, going back to before the revolution up to the present. It's a pleasure to be here today with Robert Sutton, the author of Nazis on the Potomac, the top secret intelligence operation that helped win World War II. Robert K. Sutton recently retired as chief historian of the National Park Service, which culminated a 33 year career in the service. His previous book is Stark Mad Abolitionists about the town of Lawrence, Kansas in the bleeding Kansas era of the 1850s. I was very excited to hear about Nazis on the Potomac, which was published in January. Uh, we've had several programs on German Jews who escaped Nazi Germany, came here, joined the US Army, and many served as POW interrogators. We're learning more and more about, about this in, in recent years as once secret information becomes revealed and published. And what went on at Fort Hunt is a, is a fascinating part of the story with some great characters, some interesting intelligence gathering techniques. It's really a valuable contribution. We will have books on sale here for $34.95. The Bible will be available to sign and we will send out links to purchase the book to everyone that's joining us on Zoom. For those that are on Zoom, uh, please submit questions when we get to Q and A at the end using the Q and A function in the in the Zoom application. If we uh, the chat will be open, but uh, if you want your question answered, please use the Q and A, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, since this book had a great local focus, uh, it's great to have the Capital Jewish Museum as a partner on this one, and I'd like to welcome the Justice to say a few words. I am Lisa Del Sesto, and I am one of the museum educators at the Capitol Jewish Museum. And if you'll let me, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about our new museum, which is opening in spring 2023 in downtown Washington, D.C. at the corner of 3rd and F Streets. Um, the Capitol Jewish Museum explores the past, present, and future of Jewish Washington by inviting visitors to connect, reflect, and act, connect across families and communities, reflect on the relevance of the past today, and act on behalf of their communities and values. We will focus on the theme of civic engagement, active participation in shaping your community, city, and nation, with an emphasis on the intersection of American democracy and Jewish identity and experience through our gallery exhibitions, historic synagogue, and community action lab. And we are excited to open with a special exhibition from the Skirball Cultural Institute, the notorious RBG, the life and times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and we are thrilled to partner with the National Museum of American Jewish Military History on tonight's program with Robert Sutton. As a staff, we recently learned about the story at Fort Hunt and screened the Netflix documentary Camp Confidential together. Um, and we were enthralled by the story um, with the local aspect and also kind of just the wildness that is the story that we're all gonna learn more about. Um, so we were tickled to be asked to partner on this event. Um, so on behalf of the Capitol Jewish Museum, thank you for inviting us to partner on this and having us here tonight. And with that, I will hand it over to Robert. Thank you. Thank you. This, it's a real honor for me to be here um, on many levels. Um, my wife, who was here with me, um, had family members who probably if they were still here would be members. <laughs> Um, her favorite, favorite uncle was, was a veteran of World War I, and her, she didn't know him, three times, two times, uh, great uncle was a veteran um, of the Civil War in the New Mexico Volunteers, and we think her great, great grandfather might have been a sutler uh, in New Mexico, selling, selling um, pro products to the, to the Union Army in New Mexico, so we have a connection we have a connection through our family here, and it's a great honor for me to be here. I want to, there's a lot of ways that we could start the story tonight, but what I'd like to do is start the story in Germany in the 1930s and talk about several people that uh, I think you'll find very interesting. So one young man, uh, his name was Rudolph or Rudy Pins, grew up in a town, small town in Northwestern Germany called Hoxte. And he was the only Jewish, his family, the only Jewish family in the town. Um, when he was young, um, he, he knew he was Jewish, but it didn't really matter because all of uh, his friends treated him like anybody else. He attended a Catholic school, 
Um, in fact, the one of his early memories was he had the chicken pox and his teacher came to visit him when he had the chicken pox. He was a smart kid. And after he finished the Catholic uh, elementary school, he was admitted into a really pretty exclusive gymnasium school and everything was fine. Um, he'd heard about uh, Hitler and the Nazis, but didn't really pay much attention until one day he came to school and the teacher told him that he would not be allowed to go on a field trip because he was Jewish. And this was really the first time that he encountered the fact that being Jewish made him different in this town. Well, he wasn't really aware of this, but his family uh, was aware of a program in the United States that would allow a thousand Jewish children um, to immigrate from Germany to the United States if they had a sponsor and they were under 16. So his parents applied for the program and he was accepted. So um, he, it was a very hard time for him, but his, he, he uh, was accepted. He uh, sailed over to the United States. Um, when he got here, he got on train, went to Cleveland, Ohio, where he stayed with a, uh, a foster family. Now the family um, thought everything would be fine because they were, they were fluent in Yiddish and they thought German, Yiddish, what's the difference? He said, he might as, they might as well have been speaking Chinese for all of the Yiddish he understood, but he was a smart kid. He picked up English very quickly and he, uh, he did well. Um, he was with the family for a while, but they had a state, part of the reason that they wanted to take him in is because um, they had a, a son who was roughly his age. But after about six months, he was moved to another family because the, 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 their natural son felt like he was being short shrifted because they were taking such good care of Rudy. Another young man by the name of Gustav Stern grew up in a town in Germany. Uh, it was not far from uh, Hildeschen. It was not far from Berlin. Um, his, his father was a, was a, uh, a merchant in um, a fabrics merchant doing very well. Um, his family also found out about this program, thousand, this thousand children program. Um, they were, it was, things were a little different because uh, his mother had a brother who lived in, in St. Louis. And so they, they contacted the brother. He was very happy to take Gustav um, on. The problem was you had to, in the United States, you had, you had to demonstrate that you had enough money to take care of a child when they came. Well, Gust his uncle had not done very well in the depression. Uh oh, and um, it's okay. <laughs> um, had not done well in the depression and he was broke. Well, what he did was he borrowed money from his friends. <coughs> he deposited the money in the bank. He got an affidavit that said that he had this money available, took it to the state department, said, I have plenty of money. As soon as they accepted it, he took all the money out of the bank, gave it back to his friends. <laughs> And Gustav came to the United States and stayed with his uncle in St. Louis. Um, he eventually changed his name to Guy, Guy Stern. Um, if, you, if any of you have seen the, the 60 Minutes on, um, on the Ritchie Boys, he was featured in that. And he's still alive. He just celebrated his 100th birthday very recently. Um, another young man by the name of Werner uh, Moritz um, was he... As a young man, he went to England because his mother was English. He returned to Germany in November of 1838 with the purpose of joining his family, emigrating to the United States. Well, many of you probably are aware what happened in November of, 18, of 1938, Kristallnacht, where the German youth and the Germans um, destroyed many of the German businesses and synagogues throughout Germany, but this was the real changing point, um, dramatic changing point for Jews in Germany. Um, he actually thought everything was gonna be fine when he returned to see his family in Frankfurt. But what happened was he was arrested. He was sent off to a concentration camp. Um, he never understood why, and he also never understood why about a month later he was released. He went back to Frankfurt. He was allowed to leave the country. His family was not. He didn't want to leave his family behind, but they said, you need to do this. He did. 
He went to England, eventually made his way to the United States, uh, to Halifax, Nova Scotia by himself. He went from there to Buffalo. When he got to Buffalo, he had literally 30 cents in his pocket. He eventually got his, made his way to New York. Um, he had experience uh, in textiles and he got a job there. So he made his way to the United States, but he and Rudy Penns and Guy Stern had all had to leave their families behind in Germany. Another young man, um, and he, my wife and I joke that he's sort of like my adopted father because I've talked to him a million times, he's still alive. And he tells me that next year, if he's still with us, He's inviting us to his 100th birthday. Um, his name in Germany was Paul Schoenberg, Schoenbach. His father was a very successful banker, and he remembers very, very little about his childhood. But one thing he remembered when he was 10 years old, he was told he could no longer go to school in Germany. And he also couldn't belong to a boys organization that was very similar to the Boy Scouts in Germany. Well, his father heard that and said, I'm not living in this country anymore packed up the family and moved to Palestine. And in Palestine, he tried several businesses. He was not terribly successful, but he, um, he decided that he was gonna try to get the family to the United States. So they, they relocated to the Netherlands. Um, he went to the immigration um, folks for the United States. And he said, we wanna to immigrate to the United States. He said, well, the, the man there said, well, how are you going to pay for it? He said, well, I have a stamp collection. He goes, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you have? So he pulled out, he had four stamps of the Hindenburg disaster that had not been canceled. I see someone nodding their head. You have an idea what these are worth. Um, and then he pulled out a catalog to show that they were worth over a thousand dollars. So the immigration person said, that's fine. Um, you can go to the United States. So Paul, now, when they got to the United States, they changed their name from Schoenbach, which was meant Bear Brook, to Bear Brook. So now he became Paul Bear Brook. Another um, fellow actually did not live in Germany. He actually lived in the, in the Grand Duchy of Luchten, Luchten, Luchtenburg. I think I got that right. And he, um, he said that there really wasn't any problem at any point for Jews there they were accepted as much as anybody else. It was a Catholic country, but they accepted. He said the one problem there was that the old family Jews were not very accepting of the new family Jews that came there. But everything seemed to be fine. But his father was very connected. And when he heard that the Germans were going to attack, uh, he actually snuck his family out at one o'clock in the morning before the Germans attacked, uh, they made their way to France. Eventually, they made their way to the United States. Um, he, like many others um, the, and, and his family, settled in New York in what became Washington Heights. They all went to George Washington High School. Uh, they said it was joke, jokingly called the Fourth Reich. Um, he, when, he was, when he was in uh, his home, he said he was not a very good student, was not very serious, but he decided he was going to change his life around and become a good student and a good citizen. He confessed to stealing some candy from a candy store in his home, but he, he made his way there. And it was really interesting to me that, uh, that when these, all of these um, kids came to the United States, either with or without their families, it seems like the teachers here, especially in New York, made a special effort to help them integrate into uh, the American system. Um, one of the people we talked to said that um, they encouraged them to read funny papers because they would have pictures to go with the words. And that's part of the way that they learned English. Well, they were all here, everything was fine. And then December 7th, 1941 came around. Now, I think many of you are from Washington, D.C., and I don't know if you know this, but on that day, December 7th, 1941, the Washington Redskins <laughs> were playing the Philadelphia Eagles. The game was scheduled to start at 2 o'clock. At about 1.55 Washington time, the Japanese started attacking Pearl Harbor. Well, the... Um, the owners of the, of the Redskins decided they weren't gonna tell the crowd what was going on. The game went on, 
played all the way through without any announcement that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. Now throughout, they, you know, they said, you know, so and so, please come to the, you know, come to the, to the uh, gate. Uh, you know, generals and so forth came, but um, nobody knew <laughs> that the war was going on until the game was over. The Redskins did win, by the way, um, and they were the Redskins at that time. Anyway. Many of these people who came to the United States, the uh, Pearl Harbor, December 7th, became a very significant day in their lives because um, as um, uh, Arner, Arno, Arno Mayer said, the fellow who came from Luxembourg, he said that um, uh, he was excited when it happened. He was playing tennis in New York and someone came along and told him that uh, the Japanese had attacked. He was excited and thrilled because now he knew that his new country was going to probably go to war against Germany and against Hitler. Um, there was a, a Guy Stern went with his friend to, they, they were working at a restaurant. They heard on their way to the restaurant that, that the war had started. They got to the restaurant and the uh, owner said, you might as well turn around and go home. I don't think we're gonna have much business today. My favorite story from this whole thing is Paul Fairbrook. Um, he had a job as a, as a clerk in a hotel in New York, and he managed to talk a young lady who was living in the hotel with her father to go on a date that night. Well, it was against the rules of the hotel to, to fraternize with any of the, any of the um, patrons, and he was fired on the spot. So he remembered that day very well. Um, he had fun though. 10 years later, he went back to the hotel. The same manager was there and he showed him his card, his business card. He had become the, um, the dean of the Culinary Institute of America, which is considered by many to be the top um, culinary school in the country. So he had fun with that. Well, Paul Fairbrook also decided, well, he didn't have a job, so he might as well join the army. Well, actually, he wanted to join the Marines. So he went down the next day uh, to join the Marines. Well, he found out he could not join the Marines, nor could he join the Navy, nor could he join the Army, because uh, he was considered, and many of these folks were, were, were classified as any enemy aliens. Now, this is, this, they, of course, they were anything but enemies to the United States, but this was a universal um, international um, classification that a country who's in, at war with another country, the people from that country are considered enemy aliens. So all these guys wanted to join, they couldn't because they were classified as enemy aliens. Well, before too long, the German government decided that all Jews were uh, no longer citizens. And so now they had a way to join. So Paul Fairbrook and, and others joined or were drafted um, into the military. Most of them, what they wanted to do was they wanted the government to give them a gun so they could go over to where the Germans were and kill as many Germans as they possibly could. That's what they wanted to do. But as soon as the military heard their accents, heard what they, their, that they had what appeared to be a German accent, they put them in a program that would have them be an intelligence. And so they, many of them um, were, uh, although they wanted to go to Germany or go to Europe, uh, were not allowed to, they were put into an intelligence program. And Paul Fairbrook and another fellow had an interesting observation after the war about this experience. They said, you can train somebody in six weeks or six months to shoot a gun, to throw a hand grenade, to drive a tank, all these different things but in six weeks, six months, or six years, there is no way that you can train anybody to speak German as a native did. And so they realized that their value was far, far greater in what they were doing than if they carried a gun in, in, um, in Europe. So now they, were, now they were selected for intelligence. Um, many of them were sent to a camp in, in Maryland near, um, Camp David, called Camp Rich, Camp Ritchie had been a um, had been a, a Maryland National Guard camp. Now it was it was it was changed into a military uh, intelligence training center. In fact, that was the 
over the, over the gate, it said the Military Intelligence Training Center, MITC. The fellows who were stationed there decided, no, that's not what it really meant. What it meant was Military Institute of Total Confusion. That was the joke of Camp Ritchie. Now, if you went to Camp Ritchie at this time and you looked inside the gate, you probably would think that you had accidentally stumbled onto a German cell in Maryland because there were German soldiers everywhere. They were goose stepping on the parade ground. They were going to different activities in half tracks dressed in German uniforms. German tanks were there, German everything were there. In fact, there was even a recreated German village there. And one of the people who was stationed there looked a lot like Hitler and he would get up and spew the, the venom that Hitler spewed. He looked exactly like him. So many of the people that first went there thought they, they'd made a horrible mistake and gone somewhere different. But the training was very, very intense. They would spend several weeks just all in, in general training, and then they would do something very specific. They would, they would try to determine, is this person gonna be really good at interrogating? Are they gonna be good with documents? What are they gonna be good with? And so many of these German uh, Jews who'd come from Germany and Austria and different places, um, they uh, were trained, many of them would start off with trained to be in interrogators. And what they would do is they would have a German-American soldier try to trip them up. And there's one really, really, I think it's a great story. Um, the German told the, the this student interrogator, started talking about a goulash canon. Now, goulash is a, is a Hungarian beef stew that's very popular in Germany. A canon is a cannon. So you're trying to think, how would a cannon shoot goulash? Well, actually, it was a, it was a military idiom of the German army. And what it meant was it was a, it was a, um, a mobile field kitchen. That's what they call it, a, a, a goulash canon. Well, this poor student was trying to figure out what's going on. They have the cannon, the going down the mountain, goulash coming out of it, and he's getting frustrated beyond belief. Well, what he's learning is that no matter what these trainees say, or no matter what the Germans say, you have to pay attention. You have to understand what's going on. And so the training uh, was, was intense, it was intimidating, and in fact, about 40% of the, of the students who were in, the, in this interrogation program um, actually washed out of the program. So it was very important, but Camp Ritchie um, has actually become fairly famous. It was featured in 60 Minutes. Uh, there was a film that was done on, 60, on the Ritchie Boys a couple of years ago, and so Camp Ritchie is very famous. Actually, it's still there. Um, you can actually drive right into Camp Ritchie today, um, still there. Well, many of the people who came out of Camp Ritchie and elsewhere went to Fort Hunt. Now, many of you probably know about Fort Hunt, have been to Fort Hunt. It's a very popular picnic area on the GW Parkway between Alexandria and Mount Vernon. And this is where the army decided that they were gonna have their major intelligence center uh, near Washington, DC. Um, let me give you a little background. Um, it actually originally was part of George Washington's river farm. And uh, so it had, you know, went way back to George Washington. Around the turn of the century, around 1900, it was part of the land was purchased by the government where they created a coast artillery fort, which was one of the last uh, bastions to protect Washington DC from a naval attack as, along with Fort Washington across the river. Um, it uh, continued in that use for a while. Um, in the 1930s, it became a camp for the Civilian Conservation Corps. And in fact, the King and Queen of England came to visit it. It was sort of the model of the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. But by World War II, they decided this would be a perfect location to have this um, intelligence operation. They changed the name from Fort Hunt. No one ever called it Fort Hunt. They called it Post Office Box 1142 which was the post office box where the mail came to in Alexandria. Um, the army actually at the time it belonged to the National Park Service. So the army had a cooperative agreement with um, the, the National Park Service to convert this to, um, to a fort. The cooperative agreement 
Um, I did a lot of these when I was in the Park Service, so I understand what they are. It said that the, that the military could have Fort Hunt for the duration of World War II plus one year. Well, as soon as the Army took possession of this, of this facility, they needed to have a, a, a facility for a, essentially a prison facility. And they needed to do it very quickly because the uh, Navy said that some uh, U-boat, uh, some sailors from U-boats were gonna be coming there very quickly. So the Army actually built an entire prison complex at Fort Hunt in six weeks, including uh, quarters for prisoners, uh, interrogation rooms, uh, monitoring rooms, um, a whole facility, uh, eating facilities, fences, guard houses, everything within six weeks. And part of it, one of the things that was considered the real, the real coup at this fort was they hid microphones all throughout the fort, mostly in, in the quarters where the prisoners would stay, but in, in public areas as well. And the purpose was to overhear conversations. Now, this was something new for the military. It was something that they picked up from uh, the English, who were the, the Brits who were doing this. And they decided this would be a very important part of the complex uh, that they could monitor and listen in on conversations around the fort. So there were several different programs that were run in, in, um, at Fort Hunt. One was had the initials of M-I-S-Y, Military Intelligence Section dash Y. And this was two programs. One was to interrogate prisoners. The other was to monitor conversations around the port, around the fort. Now, the way this worked was they would, they would, um, one thing that they'd learned from the British, uh, British intelligence was that Germans are more likely to speak to somebody who is at or near their same level in the military. So it's, in some ways, it's kind of funny because most of the people, most of the guys at Fort Hunt, most of these German Jews who were at Fort Hunt um, were, were non-commissioned officers. So they were like corporals or sergeants. And some of them would be interrogating like a major or a colonel. So they would wear just a regular uniform without any insignias on. And they'd say, hmm, I'm going to go interrogate a colonel. So I guess I should be a major. <laughs> So they put the, whatever it was for a major to, to interrogate. That usually worked fairly well. The way they, when it started off, when this program started off, the way that they would interrogate prisoners was they would, um, they would say, uh, you know, what's, what's your name? What's your rank? Um, are you comfortable? Are you getting everything you need? Would you like a cigarette while we're going through? They go through what their, what their name was, where they were, um, they'd start off with a lot of sort of soft toss questions, and then they get to the questions that they really wanted to ask, like U-boat um, uh, prisoners. They'd ask questions about the U-boat. What's morale like? What's going on? And then with others, they'd ask about weapons. They'd ask about different things. So <clears throat> they, were, they would try, at first they would script out the questions that they were asking, but by the end of the time at Fort Hunt, um, some of the people would say, you know, they could tell within about 10 minutes whether the person was going to have any valuable information or not. Um, so they would do this, but of course, there's going to be some Germans, especially radical Nazis, who are not going to want to say anything. They are just going to clam up and not say anything. Well, what could they do? One thing that all these people made very clear to me, and I have it, I have it in the book, several times, um, I repeat myself over and over again, they made it very clear that they never, ever use corporal punishment. They never beat any prisoner who was at Fort Hunt, ever. And they wanted to make that very, very clear. Well, if you're not going to beat somebody, what are you going to do to get information out of them? Well, the first thing that they would do was they would take them down. Fort Hunt was a, the coast artillery part of the fort had gun emplacements. And under the gun emplacements were um, powder magazines. So they'd lock them in the powder magazines for um, several hours, um, usually not overnight. And sometimes that would work. They would say, well, I don't want to, you know, they would think they might be there for a long time. And so they'd start talking. But the thing that worked absolutely flawlessly 
They had two Russian American soldiers at Fort Hunt who were dressed in Red Army uniforms. So let's say a radical Nazi doesn't want to talk. Well, one of these one of these guys, their names were um, Alexander Dallin and Alexander Shedlinsky. They would magically appear and they'd say, oh, you don't want to talk to us? How about we have Ivan here take you to the Soviet Union? Maybe they would like to hear what you have to say. And amazingly, that would usually work. They'd start talking almost immediately. Um, Guy Stern, the, the fellow that I mentioned earlier, he had a he and his partner had a wonderful way of dealing with this. Now, Guy Stern um, was not at Fort Hunt, so he's I I actually talked to him several times. I like him a lot, but he and his he went to he went to um, to Europe and interrogated prisoners there. And he and his partner had a wonderful operation, uh, good cop bad cop operation. His partners, um, Fred Howard would start interrogating German soldiers in Europe. And if they weren't talking, he'd say, well, you know, if you don't talk to me, um, I'm gonna have to turn you over to Commissar Krukov. Well, Commissar Krukov was Guy Stern. He had a tent. He wore a uniform that had ribbons and badges and everything you can imagine all over his tunic. He had a picture on the wall of the tent from um, Stalin that said, to my comrade, Commissar Krukov, um, they would come in and he would, he didn't know a word of Russian, but um, he could talk with a Russian accent in German uh, and scare the daylights out of people and they'd start talking. Um, he said um, that, that the, the success rate of using this technique to getting prisoners to talk both at Fort Hunt and elsewhere, they would get about 80% compliance um, with talking. So that's what they do if, if someone was recalcitrant and, and was not ready to talk. So the program, this um, interrogation program worked very well. It was successful. Um, it was, uh, it, over time, I think it was, it was very, it, it worked very, very well. The other program, the one where they would listen in on conversations was something that the army was very, very proud of. This is something fairly new. And what they would do is they all these, these microphones around the fort were all connected into a center where about 12 soldiers would be at a time listening in on conversations around the fort. And if they thought there was something significant, uh, they had a recorder right next to them and the recorder, actually, this was pre-reel-to-reel um, -reel recorders, and the recorder actually looked like a looked like a record player. And they would start the recording, and uh, if it was something significant, they'd make a they'd make a transcript. So between the the transcripts from the uh, in, from the monitoring program and the um, interrogations, there were there were over a hundred thousand pages of documents that are at the National Archives um, from these programs. Well, the, the way it would usually work, this monitoring program, the way, what they would always try to do is after they had after someone had been interrogated, they'd go back to the room and they'd usually have a conversation with their roommate. There could be up to three in, uh, Germans in, in a room. And they would usually um, start talking and the roommate might say, okay, what, you know, what, what did they ask you today? Well, they asked me about weapons. Well, what'd you say? Well, I didn't tell them anything. I, I lied, I told them something you know, baloney. Well, of course, then when they heard that, they would know that, that the information they'd gotten was wrong. Now, this didn't happen very often, but occasionally it did. Um, and so they would always try to follow up after an interrogation to try to get a sense of whether it was accurate or not. The program that worked really, really well um, that for, for this monitoring program was there were a number of prisoners who came through Fort Hunt who made it very clear from the outset, they didn't like Hitler, they didn't like the Germans, they didn't like the Nazis, they wanted nothing to do with it. They'd been, they'd been drafted into the army and they wanted to do whatever they could to help the Americans. After they would check them out, make sure that their story was, was accurate, they had these German prisoners, they would convert them into what they called stool pigeons or SPs. 
and they would assign them to room with Germans where they thought they might be able to get information. Now, what they could do is they could say, now, okay, now what, you know, what did you say, what did you say in the, in your uh, interrogation today? And they would say, well, I said this and this and this, but yeah, but that was wrong. That was wrong. What you should have said was, yeah, yeah, I know I should. Anyway, they got some, that, that's how they got the best information in the, in the monitoring program with these stool pigeons who were assigned uh, to bunk with, uh, with other Germans. And that program uh, worked very well. Um, this program um, of interrogation and um, monitoring uh, lasted beyond, uh, beyond World War II. And the, um, uh, the program shifted because now they were interested in having Germans help them against the Russians in the Cold War. Uh, the program is called Operation Paperclip. And so Fort Hunt continued to have a program, but it was a little bit different. So some, like, for example, the, the former um, uh, ambassador from Germany to Russia, a fellow by the name of Gustav Hilger, came to Fort Hunt, spent, spent several months there um, giving information to the Americans about the Russians, and he probably knew more about the Russians than anybody outside of Russia, so it's enormously helpful. Um, another a German general, um, Reinhard uh, Galen, came to Fort Hunt. He had been in charge of uh, German, and German army intelligence of Russia, and he was very helpful um, as well. So they had people who were helpful with the Cold War, but they also brought in scientists, engineers, uh, who were familiar with the rocket program of Germany, the, the jet program, a whole host of things um, to help out in, in um, uh, the Cold War. So it sort of shifted from wartime to modern time. And all this all happened at Fort Hunt at the same time. There's some interesting stories that come out from this period. Um, and some of the soldiers who were here, Arno Mayer, who I mentioned earlier, uh, and several others became what were called morale officers. They were very young. They probably didn't look like they had the gravitas to be very good at, mon at monitoring, I mean, at, at um, interrogating. So they became morale officers and their job was to keep these people happy so they'd stay in the United States. So everything shifts from enemies to now wanting them to be friends so that they would help out. Another fellow that I talked to, um, Peter Weiss, was there also. And he described as, as something that he heard while he was there, two, two uh, Germans who had been um, in uh, the, the had been in different um, embassies around the world had both been in Madrid, and they started talking. And one of the officers said, while he was in the embassy in Madrid, he had a wonderful liaison with this woman, and they had a wonderful romantic liaison. Turns out, the other man. This happened to be his wife. And all of a sudden there was silence in the room. And then everything broke loose and they had to come in and break up, break up the fight. Um, so sometimes they would hear things like that. Um, but the other thing was that they, they had one thing that about these folks that were at Fort Hunt, they had some free time as well. And two of the men, Arno Mayer and a friend of his, Leslie Wilson, um, had, were, were able to go to New York one weekend. Um, Mayor had set up a couple of, uh, of dates um, in New York and they were, they were gonna go catch a train to New York. So they went out on the parkway and hitched a ride. The first car that came along, there were three women in the car. The woman sitting in the back seat got in the front seat. They sat in the back. They said, where are you going? We're going to Union Station. They said, well, we can't take you that far but we can get you close. Well, after they started talking and they had some fun with them, um, they took them all the way to Union Station and they got on the train and started going to New York. So they looked at each other and they said, did you hear what I heard? Did you hear they, them calling the woman who sat in the middle, Mamie? And did you hear them talking about her husband as General Eisenhower? And they said, yeah, I heard that. So they got to New York and checked out and found out, yes, indeed, Mamie was, was Eisenhower's wife. And they were talking about General Eisenhower. So he said, well, you know, that was really nice of them. Maybe we should write a letter to her and thank her for giving us a ride. 
And they did. Now, this is after World War II. Dwight Eisenhower is now the chief of staff in the War Department. And so they write a letter to him to, for him to give to his wife, right? A couple of days later, they're called into their commanding officer's office. They're absolutely petrified because they know that they're in trouble. They know that they're in trouble, but they walk in the office and the officer starts almost bowing to them. And they go, what's going on here? So he shows them, hands them a letter. They open it up. It's from General Eisenhower. And it says, dear so-and-so, dear, dear sergeants, mayor, and Wilson, I'm writing this letter for my wife. She wanted me to thank you for thanking her for giving you a ride. He said, we always like to pick up young soldiers because we always learn something and it's always wonderful and blah, blah, blah. Um, so all of a sudden they became the heroes of the fort. And actually the, the wonderful thing is they both donated, one kept the envelope and one kept the letter and they donated both to us and, and it's in the book. <laughs> the letter and the envelope are in the book. Uh, I think that's one of the really, really amazing stories of Fort Hunt. Um, the, um, there's another program here called MIRS or Military Intelligence Research Section. And what they did was they translated, analyzed and translated uh, documents that were captured on the battlefield. Uh, and they, over time, they, connect, they, they uh, looked at over 150 tons of documents. Um, Paul Fairbrook worked in this program, and he said that every time a German sneezed, they would document it. Um, and it turned out that this was, a, was a incredibly valuable information. Um, they found that a couple of things were very, were very important. One was the, um, uh, they had these cards that were, or it was like a passport called a passbook. And it documented everything about every soldier in, in, um, in the German army. They also were required to carry a card with them that, that would document brothels that they had visited. The Germans had official brothels. And they would visit these brothels and it would say which one they were at and who the, who the sex worker was that they saw. And these in turn were very valuable as well. The main thing that came out of this MIRS program, the, the, the most valuable piece that came out of here was the, it was called the Red Book or the, the, the Order of Battle of the German Army. And this was a huge book. They had like three different versions of it. It was probably the most valuable thing that came out of, uh, out of this program because it told, it described every single division in the German army, who the commander was, who the chief of staff was, where it was, where it had been, what its strength was and so forth. It went into great lengths talking about the Gestapo. That was very valuable as well. But they also did some individual, they were also able to do um, projects based on what they had found. So Paul Fairbrook, one of his jobs is to look at the organization charts of the German army. And one day he noticed that there was a new box for a morale officer that had not been there before. This was added right after the assassination attempt on Hitler. And he, and he mentioned this to his boss. He said, okay, you should, why don't you track this down and find out what, what this is. What he found was that Hitler was so paranoid after the attempt on his life that he set up this whole organization of morale officers to try to make sure that everybody was loyal to him. And it almost became more important that people were loyal to him than, than worrying about fighting the war. It became very important. So the military intelligence research, research section was incredibly valuable as well. It was about 18 people worked in this section. The man who was in charge of this section was, was German, but not Jewish. His name was John Kluge. And if that name's familiar to, her, to you, in about the mid 80s, he was considered the richest man in the United States. He just sold a company called Metro Media. Um, and he, but he got his start at Fort Hunt. It's very interesting. Um, there was another program, I'm not gonna really talk about it because it's, it's not um, related to this, uh, called MISX, which was escape and evasion. And what this program did, it set up a whole encryption system to communicate between Fort Hunt and prisoners of war in 
Germany. And it also established um, packages that they would send to these folks. It would have like a, a radio would be, radio transmitter would be in a cribbage board or in a baseball. And maps would be hidden in, in game boards and so forth. Uh, it was a very, very important program, MISX, also at Fort Hunt. Well, the, the reason that we know about this program was because um, in about the mid but 70s and 80s and 90s, more and more of the um, documents from World War II were declassified. All the men who were stationed at Fort Hunt at Post Office Box 1142 were sworn to secrecy for the rest of their lives. They all thought that they would take this story, whatever story they had there, to the grave. And so it was really difficult to get a lot of them to talk about this program. But between 2006 and 2010, uh, the National Park Service historians were able to interview about 65 of the folks who were stationed there. And some of them we had to actually carry a document that had their name on it to show that they could talk. Because most of them just were very, very reluctant to talk, even though we were able to show them a letter from, this, from the War Department saying they could talk, show them documents and everything else. But this became the basis of this story. And I think it's just an amazing story. So amazing that I was afraid it was gonna be lost and decided that I should write this book. And I did. And I'm really glad I did because I think it's a very, very valuable story. Now, ultimately, what, what is really important here? Well, to me, the thing that came across to me over and over and over again was this, what they said that they never, ever beat a German, never, ever had corporal punishment. That was very important. The other thing um, that I read was that by the end of the war, the intelligence operation of the Allies primarily the British and the Americans, was so sophisticated, many think that Eisenhower knew more about the German army than Hitler did. And I think there's some, some validity to that, to that argument. Um, I'm not an expert on this, but um, the folks at Fort Hunt and elsewhere um, definitely had an impact on the war and ending the war. And experts now determined and I think it's probably fairly valid that the war probably was shortened by about two years based on the intelligence gathering of folks at Fort Hunt and otherwhere, other places. And I think that is uh, really the important part of the story is that this was a really incredibly important part of ending World War II. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to take questions. Documents that they interpreted. Where did they come from? Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. First of all, so I understand it. Sure. <laughs> I understand that one perfectly, yes. but so the folks um, that are looking at it online can understand. So the question is, where did they get the documents? Yes. Where did they come from? Okay, uh, good question. Um, there were in the field, there was generally an officer and several enlisted men whose main job was to collect all the documents they could find. Now, their job was not to analyze whether they were important or not, but if it looked like it had German written on it, they would collect these documents in, um, in Europe, in the, wherever the battlefield was. They'd package them up. They generally would, there's an office, MIRS had an office in London as well. And so at first go to London, they'd start to analyze it. And then they would package up many of the documents and send them to, um, to Fort Hunt. Um, and so they, they early on, they, they didn't realize the value of documents, but very quickly they realized the value. And so they actually, they act, the, the army actually had a, a concerted effort to collect as many documents as they could get their hands on. Didn't worry about how important they were. Someone else could do that. But that's why this was such an important program because of all the documents they captured. Let me just give you an example. Um, so uh, one day um, they got a newspaper, an obscure newspaper that showed a, a photograph from the wedding of, uh, of um, Rommel's daughter. 
and they showed all these generals who were there. Well, one of the generals happened to be at Fort Hunt. So they passed that along and they went up and said, well, you know, we saw you at Rommel's wedding. Well, how do you know that? Well, we were there, we saw it. We saw you talking to so-and-so because they saw him standing next to another general. Um, and so sometimes it could be used for interrogation, but sometimes it, like they had, a, they had a copy, they were able to, one of the real coups was to get a copy of the Reichstag phone book. And so they could have someone there and they say, well, we know you called so-and-so. Well, how do you know that? Well, we know that your phone number was so-and-so and so-and-so's -so number was this. Well, between that and the, the, these, these brothel cards were probably the most valuable thing they had for interrogations because a lot of guys did not want their wives to know that they, duh, to a brothel. So they'd say, well, we saw you went to brothel AG, and, AG or whatever it was, and you were with Maria. Well, how do you know that? Well, we know that. We, 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 we actually know that. And they would all of a sudden, either one of two things, they'd feel guilty and start spilling the beans. Or they would say, they know so much, I might as well just tell them everything. <laughs> and so um, some of the documents could be used actually in interrogation, but the real value was, was preparing these things like the, the Red Book, the, the Order of Battle of the German Army and so forth. And so uh, it just, the, the value was just incredible. And the Germans, you know, it was good for them, I guess, keeping all these documents. But I think it was actually in some ways better for the allies because they knew how to use them. They knew how to interpret them. And each, each person in this office had a specialty and that's how they did it. The other, yes, let me. Do you know if these guys had contact with the local Jewish community? Uh, the question is, did they have contact with the, with the local Jewish community? Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, I think most of them, from what I gather, were not particularly um, observant Jews. Um, Guy Stern was. His family was very observant. I think he continued to be very, very ob observant. Um, he ended up going to Europe. And I, I honestly don't know. Uh, that I just I, We don't have any documentation within these. Now, one of the things that's frustrating I based a lot of this, of this story, this book, on these uh, interviews that we did between 2006 and 2010. Well, part of the reason that we wanted to do it as quickly as we could, at that time, World War II veterans were dying at a rate of about one every 90 seconds. And so we were against, we were against time trying to catch all these folks. Well, most of them are now gone. And so I'd love to go back and ask them a question like that. You know, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Uh, so I don't, I, I don't have that. That just was not part of the of the of the um, pro, pro, program that we got. Yes, sir. I'm curious if you know um, of the interrogators at Fort Hunt. What's the breakdown in terms of those of Jewish German descent, those of German descent who were not Jewish, or non-native German speakers, people who either learned German or used German? There were, there were, and actually, we we actually interviewed some of them. Some of them were were um, some of them were not Jewish and not German, um, but they were, but they had studied German. Some had been to Germany, um, you know. That so that yes, there were some that were in all the categories. Um, John Kluge was born in Germany. He came here when he was a very young young boy. Um, and it's funny, his, the people that he supervised said he really, his German was not that good, um, but he was a good supervisor. He, he understood, this is really, I find this fascinating. Um, you know, he was tremendously successful in business. And I think he sort of learned from being at Fort Hump. I, this is totally me. And if you think I'm crazy, that's fine. Um, but his people were so dedicated. All the ones, all the ones that we interviewed who were in this MIRS program, um, they said that they were actually excited when the mailbag came in because they could actually get into what they were doing. He left them alone. He said, you know, these guys are smart. They're dedicated. If I leave them alone, they're going to do better work than if I ever, than I really. So he, he was one of these, one of these hands off supervisors. And personally, I think that helped him later in his business, you know, pick people who can do a good job and let them go. But yes, there were, there were folks, I know that there were folks. Now, I don't know the breakdown, total breakdown. I don't, 
It's just, I don't have that information. I mean, we have the names of everybody. And one of the frustrations for me doing this book, uh, much of the time when I did the book, the archives were closed. <laughs> And, and the archives at Fort Hunt were at the, it's part of the George Washington Parkway were closed. So um, I couldn't check some of the things that I would have liked to have checked um, like that. Any other questions? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Let me answer your second question first, then we'll go back to your first question. So the question was, does, but, um, as I understand it, I think you're saying, why did the Park Service see this as a big project? Is that, is that essentially what your question is? Compared to, all Compared to other things. Okay, this, there's a great story with this. Um, because this was top secret, the Park Service knew virtually nothing about this story. And in 2000, um, the, the park um, commissioned doing a historic resource study. That's something that we do for parks around the country. And at that time, the fellow who did this study went to the National Archives and found out that many of the documents connected to Post Office Box 1142 had been declassified. So he wrote a chapter on in this book on Post Office Box 1142 for the park, right? So now they knew that there was this story. What they didn't know was if the people who were there were still alive and willing to talk about it. So one, one day, uh, one of the rangers at the park in 2000, I believe it was 2005, um, I've got it in the book, I can't remember dates. I'm a historian, I cannot remember dates to save my life. Put a gun to my head and I can't tell you what dates which. Either 2005 or 2006, was giving a tour of Fort Hunt. Um, they did this, you know, they talked about the, about the George Washington's um, river farm, the Coast Artillery Fort and so forth. At the end of the tour, she said, and I actually talked to her to find out what she, what she did here. And she, at the end of the tour, she said, you know, what we'd really like to be able to do, we're finding out a little bit more about this, this post office box 1142. What we'd really like to be able to do is find people who are stationed here that we can talk to. Well, a woman who was on this tour raised her hand. She said, you know, I had a neighbor who was here. They since have moved away, but I have his contact information. And, and um, I don't know much because he didn't say much, but you can contact him and see what his name was Fred Michelle. Um, he had lived, he actually lived after the war, lived right near, um, uh, Fort Hunt. Um, and so um, the ranger who at the fort contacted him. He'd moved to Louisville, Kentucky, contacted him and said he wanted to interview him. Well, it was on, off, on, off, on, off. And Brandon Beast, the, the fellow who um, who had contacted him, sort of suspected that maybe he was he was a little bit concerned about saying anything since he'd been sworn to secrecy. So when he went to, when he finally got to, got a set an appointment to go see him, he packed several of the of the interviews that he had done with his name on them <laughs> in his briefcase, showed them to him, and said, "See, you can talk about it now." And with that first interview, he gave the name of several other people that he remembered who were there, 
one thing led to another, and that's how we built the names of 65 people who were there and developed this story of what had happened at Fort Hump. And that, it, without that, there's no way I could have written this book. So it started kind of with a little spark and then took off and became a very, very uh, important story. We had a couple of um, uh, reunions at Fort Hunt where we invited the people who had been stationed there. And it, and it was, it, they're actually in the post so you can, you can go back and look at the, at these. In 2006 and 2007, we had um, reunions there. And it was during the time when the whole thing with Abu Ghraib was, was in the news. And the people who came, they, every single one of them wanted to make it very, very clear that what they did at Fort Hunt was very different than what they did at Abu Ghraib. They did not beat anybody. And they wanted everybody to understand that. So that was very important. Um, your second question, which was, did that, how, did this, in, how did this interrogation technique carry over into later wars? I honestly don't know if I can answer that because I just don't know that much about, about later wars. I do know, I do know that by the time it got to Vietnam and of course, um, Iran and Afghanistan, the, uh, the military and the, and the uh, intelligence gathering operation changed dramatically. Torture in Vietnam and elsewhere became common rather than the exception. And so whatever they learned at Fort Hunt by the time, I don't know about Korea, I just, I don't know um, about interrogation there, but I do know that in Vietnam and, and elsewhere, uh, it had changed dramatically. Um, and um, what's, what's interesting is, is the, the studies that have been done on interrogation uh, I actually looked at the Senate. The Senate actually did a, a, a very large study on this. And I looked at their study that they published. And the experts say that, that torturing prisoners doesn't work for several reasons. First of all, they're going to say whatever, whatever you want to hear because they don't want to be tortured anymore, right? Whether they know anything or not, they're going to say what you want to hear. And there's a wonderful story from World War II, um, a pilot an American pilot was captured in Japan. And right after the two bombs were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, they were torturing him and they were saying, how many, how many atomic bombs do the Americans have? He didn't, first of all, he didn't even know that they had the Manhattan Project, didn't know anything about any of the bombs. He said, well, there, there are a thousand and they're gonna drop them all on Japan. Cause he didn't want to be tortured anymore. So. Um, the thing that's, that came, uh, that I think is really important from this, one of the lessons that are very important from this is that um, torturing prisoners does not generally get you the information that you're trying to get to. It just doesn't. So I, does that, does that answer? Okay, thank you. Anyone else here? We do have a few from uh, Zoom. Okay. Uh, Jay Goldberg asks, uh, were local civilians aware of the presence of German POWs in their midst? Were locals aware of German POWs in their midst? Um, <laughs> the park actually talked to some of the people who'd lived around there forever. They knew something was going on. <laughs> they knew that something was going on there because the fences were up. Um, there was a uh, they had a bus that had blacked out windows that came that came came and left, so they knew something was going on, and uh, some of them suspected that there was something like this going on, but um, they really didn't know any details about it at all. In fact, some of them later said, "Oh gosh, I didn't know that." <laughs> they lived nearby and didn't know that all this had been going on. So. Uh, they might have known something was going on, but the, the, what, we, what we've been able to gather is that they did not know the extent of what was going on. In fact, what's fascinating about um, Post Office Box 1142, these three programs, MISY, which was the interrogation and monitoring, MISX, which was the escape and evasion program, and MIRS, the people who worked in these programs had absolutely no clue what the others were doing. 
they, they would have dinner with them, have lunch with them, but they had no idea what each was doing. So even within the port, they didn't know what was going on in the other programs. We're from Barbara N. How were soldiers recruited for this program? From where? How were they identified as Jewish? Were they initially conceived as a group of Jewish soldiers? And were there any women? Um, there were no women that I know of at Fort Hunt. So I'll answer that question first. Did everybody understand, hear the question here? Don't, I mean, don't need, you repeated it. So they've got it there on the, okay. Uh, I don't know that there are any women at, at Fort Hunt. Now there were women recruited for intelligence um, and some of them went through uh, Camp Ritchie. There's actually a wonderful book that came out right before my book on Camp Ritchie called, oh gosh, what is it? Uh, Ritchie Boy Secrets, is that? By uh, Beverly Eddy, yeah. It's a, it's a wonderful book. And she does talk about women who actually went through that program. Um, oh gosh, who's the, the cook? Um, I'm drawing a blank. They're doing a TV show. Julie Child. Julie Child. She was she was in military intelligence, and she actually got her training at Washington State University, where I got my PhD. We're, we're very proud of her as one of our, I guess we could call her alumnus. <laughs> um, yes, there were women, but as far as I know, they were not part of the program at Fort Hunt. And what was the other part? I'm sorry. Oh, they, they, did they? How did they know they were Jewish? I think the fact that they were Jewish was less significant to the army than the fact that they were German and that they, they knew that the language was, uh, was their native language. They understood the nuances. I think when they found out that they were Jewish and knew that many of them were refugees from Germany, Austria, and elsewhere, um, that was an added bonus. But I don't think that was the primary reason that they were selected because they were Jewish. But in many cases, it was that they just heard their accent. Many of the soldiers that we talked to um, said that they were in some other program, and when they heard their accent and thought they were German, they automatically, very quickly, were, were uh, recruited for this program. Um, Peter Weiss said that um, he, his officer called him in and said, you sound like you have an accent. He actually was from Austria, from Vienna. Um, he said, can you say anything in German? So he recited a big long passage from Goethe. He actually was going to, um, he was going to, um, it was in college at St. John's in Annapolis where the great books. So he could recite Goethe probably in English and in German. He said, okay, you're in. <laughs> so that's part of the way that they, that they were mostly that they heard their accents and said, okay, you know, where are you from? I'm from Germany. Okay, go to Camp Ritchie. We're just about out of time. So let's end on this one from, from Chris Waldman. Uh, excellent book. Will you be writing a sequel? <laughs> I ran out of gas by the time I got to the end of this one. Uh, I would say probably not. <laughs> um, first of all, um, you know, this, is a, this was a, a wonderful experience. Um, reading all of these interviews, and as I said, part of the frustration was that um, I couldn't go back and ask follow-up questions because a lot of these fellows were gone. So I don't even know how I could do anything beyond this I could talk to. There's one, there's one person that I didn't mention um, who, um, his story, I think, is one of the most compelling of all. He's still alive, and I've talked to him also. George Whitinger. George Whitinger lived in a town near um, uh, Vienna in Austria. And um, he went to school one day, and the teacher said, you need to go see the principal. Well, I know when I went to school, and the teacher said, I need to go see the principal. It was never good news, ever. They weren't going to give me a scholarship or anything. It was something that I'd done. Well, he went to see the principal, and the principal said, you cannot go to school anymore. And he said, why not? He said, because you're Jewish. He looked at it. The principal, he said, I'm not Jewish. I'm Christian. Turned out his parents had converted to Jude, from Judaism to Christianity years before, never told him that they had done this. As far as he knew, he was as Christian, in fact, more Christian than anybody, because in his school, uh, 
the local Lutheran minister taught the religion class. Uh, so he'd go to Sunday school and go to church. So the minister would see him on the front row and hopefully give him an A. Um, and also the woman that took care of their house was Catholic. And she sometimes would take he and his brother to the Catholic church during the week. So he thought he was as Christian as anybody, but he found out, they said, you're Jewish and you can no longer go to school. Um, and this was, this was a real shock to him. Shock to me, to be honest, because that's the link they went to to try to identify who was Jewish um, in Austria and Germany. But um, no, I don't think I'm going to do a sequel on this. I think I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start reading other people's books. <laughs> Try to learn something else. Thank you.